the people that we work for, that we're trying to do things quicker, uh, better, stronger. Um, but there's also a selfish reason that we should be doing innovation. And that selfish reason is really for our industry. Um, when we start looking at the, uh, the industry as a whole, and we start looking at the people that are in the industry, this, this group is a pretty good cross section. I'll say that uh, there's a lot more people with a, you know, a little lighter hair. I think it's probably the camera actually that's making my hair lighter because you know, as you can see in my picture, it's pretty dark there. So I'm, I can't be going gray. But um, just like everybody else, uh, every other industry, uh, we're losing a lot of people. We've got a brain drain going on as our baby boomers retire and, and we, we don't have new people coming in. So we're going to be competing, or we are competing, but we're, the competition is going to get more vigorous for the best and brightest to go into uh, transportation. So in my opinion, we need to make sure that the new people coming up, whether they're tradesmen or craftsmen or um, uh, whether they're college graduates, actually high school graduates, because that's where we need to start recruiting from, we need to show those people that there's a broad horizon in transportation where you can use your skills, your, your ingenuity, uh, and innovation to try to solve some of the problems that we have in transportation. That's not just the same old, same old, and you know, rinse, wash, and repeat. Um, in all of my transportation classes that I teach at, uh, at Michigan Tech, one of the things we always try to get across to the students is the problems, the size of the problems in transportation are so huge, and they have such an impact on quality of life and economy um, that there's real good motivation. They're not just good things that we'd like to do or good problems that we'd like to solve or interesting problems. They're huge problems for our local community, uh, for our state and for our nation. So um, that's the selfish reason for innovation. So today the innovations I'm gonna talk about are, are three smaller innovations that relate to taking data and transferring that data into information. So a lot of times people use those two terms kind of um, switch back and forth between them using this the interchangeably uh, data are just the raw facts and data costs money information is something that we can act on so information is what we try to wring out of of data we try to get decision support out of data so today i'm going to talk about three examples of that uh, in projects that we've been really um, associated with here at, at our center um, two of them are software programs and we'll talk about the actual data extraction or the, the information extraction process. And then the other one is a study. So the first innovation I wanna talk about is, is something that's not really new as a whole. It's an older project actually, is, is the software RoadSoft. And so I think probably everybody has heard about RoadSoft, but maybe doesn't know the details of, of uh, all the different things that RoadSoft does. So it started in 1992 as kind of a uh, collaboration between Michigan local agencies, the state DOT and Michigan Tech. And it was started as a way to get an asset management system specifically for Michigan local agencies that was available without a, an upfront cost to them. And so jump forward a couple of years and today we have about 330 cities and villages using RoadSoft. All 83 road commissions are using RoadSoft in some shape, way, shape or form. Uh, there's uh, 21 regional or metro planning agencies that are using it in some way, shape, or form. And MDOT Traffic and Safety is using it as their main interface to the crash data in Michigan. So when we talk about RoadSoft, I think a lot of times people think uh, GIS, it's just a place to store data. And that's where a lot of the focus has been on when we talk, talk about RoadSoft has been the data side of things. Um, RoadSoft is kind of a uh, one-stop shop for local agencies for uh, asset management data. But we've always really focused on the tools. So the data were just the, the uh, means to an end. The tools are really what I wanna talk about. And I'm gonna talk about just a couple of the tools um, that are, that are uh, in this list today. So first let's start with the data side. So there's a lot of data in RoadSoft and this is just user data. So this is data that local agencies have collected themselves. So this isn't data like bridge data, all the bridge data is in RoadSoft. Um, all the crash data, the 360,000 odd crashes per year are in RoadSoft. It's actually a way we can distribute data out to local agencies. But this is actually just user data. So these are things that people have collected, counties, cities have collected. And if we look at just the first three, roads rated, signs, and culverts that are in RoadSoft, 
there's in excess of about $15 million of data in just those three little buckets. And the road data, uh, we have 160 or 186,000 lane miles of road rated uh, on the local side. That's just with at least one rating. I know there are, we know there are county road commissions that have data that goes back into the 90s. Um, so this is probably orders of magnitude lower when we start looking at repeated measures um, in road data. So um, I think this is an interesting thing because this is this is not none of this is mandatory. This is um, other than some of the federal aid road collection. The rest of this is all optional. This is part of their business process. So what does what does Roadsoft do with the data? What's the value? So one of the first tools we built in Roadsoft was a pavement deterioration model that that was the main purpose of Roadsoft was to try to link um, pavement condition um, investments in terms of the different treatment strategies with outcomes. So what's the condition going to be out into the future? So there's two basic models that are in Roadsoft. One is a deterioration model that looks at repeated measures of uh, condition and for every road segment tries to make a prediction of how many years of remaining service life are left in that road segment. There's also a network level model that takes all of those small segment level models and rolls it up into an overall network model. So this model is where local agencies can try to determine what the future is gonna look like given uh, a certain strategy of different types of fixes. So if we continue at the current budget numbers and the current splits of reconstruction, rehabilitation and preventive maintenance, where are we gonna end up in the future? So you know, this in itself is not um, that ground ground shaking. This was actually built based on some tools that that Michigan DOT had, um, a tool by the name of RQFS. Um, but what's interesting about this is it's widely distributed to local agencies. So pretty much every local agency has access to this and has the ability to do this kind of forecasting. Once we do those types of forecasts and understand what our strategy is going to be, uh, we've some of the newer functions that we have are things like this Roadsoft uh, project planner tool. So when we have a strategy of different types of fixes that we're going to try to do a certain number of miles of different types of fixes, um, we have to find candidates for those. And so the tool allows us to select a fix like fog seal or a uh, chip seal rather, and it'll find candidates in, in a given year. We can go ahead and plan those for future construction. And once they're planned as future construction, when we skip to the next year of the plan, uh, those are no longer candidates. They don't show up as highlighted again. And in the future, uh, if we go years and years in advance in the future, those segments will again become candidates. So it's kind of that idea of trying to, to help find that right fix, right place, right time. So to help plan, uh, plan, schedule, and execute projects. Another tool that we have in Roadsoft is actually kind of an interesting thing. It came out of a study that the Transportation Asset Management Council asked us to do. So I believe the high watermark in asset management uh, in terms of implementation is when agencies start using their own data to start to drive policy. So what types of work are we going to do? Uh, what, what benefits do we get out of the different types of work? So a couple of years ago, the Asset Management Council asked us to look at the service lives that local agencies were getting out of different types of payment fixes. Um, so we did a study using local agency data. Um, so we requested data from all sorts of different uh, road commissions and cities. And we analyzed that data to try to determine the average treatment life. So again, this is something DOTs frequently do. Um, Michigan DOT did a study like this a couple years back. And they do it on a, I don't know if it's a 10 year or 15 year rotating basis. But this is something that um, we did a study. And then as part of the study, we created a tool that would actually make this part of Roadsop. So we can go through and find uh, the different types of treatments that have been entered along with the different ratings that are there. And we can measure the extension in service life um, from each of those different classes of fixes whether it's a, a group of fixes or an individual fix type. And so that's a tool that's in Roadsoft that's available to local agencies today with the data that they have. Another request we got from TAMSI was uh, to try to come up with an asset management plan, easy button, that was their words. Come up with an easy button. Um, you know, something that we can basically take data that's in Roadsoft and push out an asset management plan. Uh, in accordance with Public Act 320, uh, 325, 2018. So 
what we ended up doing was creating a macro enabled spreadsheet that we can export data from Roadsoft. It goes into the spreadsheet uh, um, and the macros in that spreadsheet uh, basically build all the charts and graphs um, and the user fills out basic information in a questionnaire format, including their name, you know, who, who, um, uh, who's the designated person for the report. And once that information is all filled out in the spreadsheet, we can push a button and it goes to the template and it pushes it to a Word document that you can edit. So our intent with creating this macro and these templates was that as data changes over the years, um, you don't have to go back and try to recreate all those graphs and charts. The, the macro does it for you um, and pushes all that information into the Word document. So the intent is to try to get um, our local agencies focused on doing the hard work that nobody else can do, which is coming up with strategies, coming up with different fixes, um, things that are very personal to them uh, for the success of their road network and have them spend less time figuring out how to make a chart or graph or how, to, how do we get this data in a, a usable format. Last thing I wanna talk about with regard to data is uh, again, Roadsoft has data collection tools um, that have been adopted by the Asset Management Council for uh, annual pavement collection. And it's, um, I think, a unique way of doing it. So we have data that's collected on the county level or city level that's rolled up to the region. So the region gets a copy of the data. And then that same data is used on the state level to report for Michigan or for the Michigan Transportation Asset Management Council. So it's a collect once, use three times uh, type of model. And that's important, again, because data is expensive. OK, so what does this all get us? You know, we've got this tool, we've got data, um, and then Michigan Transportation Asset Management Council has a lot of educational activities that go on. So these are our um, uh, graphs that came out of TAMSI's annual implementation report. So every year they survey local agencies to find out um, uh, a number of factors that relate towards asset management implementation. So this is kind of the report card that the Asset Management Council uses to measure themselves. So what good are we doing as the Asset Management Council and what, what areas do local agencies, uh, road owners need help? So the first one I, I think is interesting is, again, this is just local agencies, it's use of asset management systems. And so this is representative of the, um, the counties and large cities in the state. So uh, only 4% of respondents said they weren't using any type of an asset management system. That to me is huge. Um, some of the other studies I've seen from other states, they're, they're somewhat dated, but those numbers are typically more like 25 to 30% implementation of an asset management system. So the fact that we have, you know, 90% of our local agencies using an asset management system, either paper or electronic is, is pretty amazing. When we start asking questions about, can you connect your funding to future outcomes? So if you went to elected official and elected official told you you were going to get more or less funding, could you show what that outcome is going to be in years to come? And only 11% said, no, we don't have the ability to do that currently. So again, that's that important part where we are able to talk to the taxpayer, the elected official, and show the value for the money. This is what um, the funding that we get is, is worth in terms of outcomes. The other part that I think I'm, I'm probably most proud of is uh, local agencies, only 3% said that they didn't use pavement data for a selection of projects, pavement condition data. So that's a huge change from uh, say 10, 15, well, not 10, but 15 or 20 years ago, uh, when it was pretty much engineering judgment based on, on where a lot of project selection was done. Uh, again, method for selecting project, um, only 17% said they're still using the worst first approach. And that was for a number of different reasons. So the vast majority are using a mix of fixes approach. And again, the high watermark, I think, is assessment of project benefits. So um, only 17% said they did not frequently assess the, the quality uh, or, or the outcomes of the different types of projects that they get from, a, from an extended service life um, measure. So again, these are all extremely, extremely positive things as far as implementation goes for local agencies and asset management. Uh, Roadsoft is not the only reason that this stuff happened. There's obviously a huge effort on the Asset Management Council's behalf to try to get these things done. So, so why is this innovative? Well, 
the focus with Roadsoft and with the Asset Management Council has always been a data tools and training approach. So it's not just, here's a tool, good luck with it. You know, read the manual, good luck guys. Um, it's always uh, been, uh, you know, kind of the walk down the path with you approach. So we do literally thousands of hours of tech support trying to get positive outcomes for local agencies. How do I do this? How do I move forward? What, what can I do uh, to get this type of information? Um, we're creating a data set. The local agencies have created a data set that can be used to drive their own practice, both on a state level and on an individual level. And I think that really is the, the high watermark of asset management. Again, the, the format of collect once, use three times is important when we're talking about millions of dollars worth of data. And then uh, I think what's interesting with Roadsoft is it kind of becomes a medium for data exchange. So we push out crash data every year to local agencies. Uh, it comes with the delivery uh, file of Roadsoft. We push out bridge data, local agencies submit data back. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for being on that same uh, geographic base map and using the same format to send data back and forth. Last part is it's user driven. It always has been user driven. These are tools that users have asked for and uh, we've helped uh, to build. So. Okay, let's talk about another interesting um, tool that we have out there. So this is what you don't want to see when uh, seasonal weight restrictions come on. And uh, of course, this is uh, the, the thing that keeps uh, pavement engineers up at night is uh, knowing that weight restrictions are not and you get something like that. So seasonal weight restrictions are a definite source of consternation uh, between our users and the people that are charged with protecting the investment in the pavements that we have. So um, there's been a lot of work done in this area. There's some really well-known freeze-thaw models that FHWA created um, back in the 80s or 90s. And there's some updates to those models that, that Minnesota DOT has created um, to deal with gravel roads. And um, the County Road Association has done a great job with um, a committee, their engineering committee, that has looked at trying to, to unify how, how counties, at least, look at seasonal weight restrictions. Um, and so they did a lot of work and technology really wasn't the problem, it was the application. So years back, the engineering committee of the County Road Association built a seasonal weight restriction spreadsheet. And this is based on the Federal Highways um, model, the, the degree day uh, freeze thaw model. Um, and this was a great start because this did all the calculation for you. All you had to do is get high temp, low temp, average temp. So it seems pretty easy. How hard can that be? Well, the problem is you have to do it every day. <laughs> you have to do it every day. You have to log in to a weather service. You have to grab those data. Um, you have to grab a forecast if you want to make a forecast. And then you have to try to read it out to the spreadsheet. So um, years after the spreadsheet was built, uh, I believe it was Wayne Schoonover from um, uh, Grand Traverse County said, don't you guys know somebody that can automate this whole process for us? And he was making a thinly veiled jab at us. Like, can't you help us do this so it's easier? And uh, we said, yeah, we probably probably know somebody that can do that. So we took the time to set up um, a uh, data sharing agreement with one of the weather services. That was kind of a surprise when we called, I think it was Weather Underground, uh, to try to find out, hey, what would it take to get all of the temperature data for the state of Michigan. And they said, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. We're like, oh boy, better start looking for another source. <laughs> so we um, we have a source of data that will allow us to distribute it to local agencies in the Thoughtcaster application. It's a web app. These are all of the stations. These are all the places where there's uh, temperature measurements. So we, our goal is to try to get uh, two or three in every county. Um, so that people could look at, at uh, the different weather data. So we've got a continuous stream of weather data for each of those. The app is a web-based app, so counties, cities, and MDOT can log in to their own account and do work in, in their own account. And you can select stations, you can look back at history. We've got, I don't know how, 10 years of data, historical data. And basically it carries out those functions of the two freeze-thaw models, the degree, degree day models that are out there. So it'll come up with a recommendation on when seasonal weight restrictions may go on and when they are likely to come off, as well as doing calculations on the thaw depth or the freeze and thaw depth. So um, again, it's not a real hard problem. You could do it in a spreadsheet, but this kind of automates that task. It also uses uh, 10 day outlook to try to make predictions to allow uh, local agencies 
to be able to communicate with the users and tell them when seasonal weight restrictions are likely to hit. It's not, okay, tomorrow they're going on. There's uh, a, a longer term outlook. One of the other parts we can get out of this are maps like this, which is a, a histogram that shows similar seasonal weight restriction days. And so this is something that the counties have used to try to um, figure out who's in their peer group, right? Who has weight restrictions that are similar to ours? Who should we be kind of coordinating and looking like, looking at? Um, who's like us? Um, so these maps have been kind of interesting, and I think they've helped uh, road commissions start to uh, consider whose group, you know, who, whose groupings, uh, uh, who are my peers in the area. So why is it innovative? Again, the the main focus is its implementation. It's trying to uh, make a tool that's uh, uh, simple in terms of uh, usability. It, it's you don't have to find the temperature data every day and dump it in a spreadsheet. It does it for you. So that simple act has led to more and more agencies using um, these more advanced methods, whether it's uh, smaller cities um, or or um, uh, road commissions. So it provides uniformity in method and it provides uniformity in data access. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is a study, and this is kind of an interesting study that we did for the Asset Management Council that kind of led to another um, uh, line of inquiry for innovation. So uh, a couple years back when Public Act 325 went into law, uh, it charged the Michigan Transportation Asset Management Council with things beyond the pavement. And some of those things were signals, traffic signals, and some of those things were culverts. And so as the Transportation Asset Management Council was starting to look at how do we deal with signals, traffic signals, as a council, at a state level, what, what type of data to collect should we collect, um, what should local agencies collect, thing, things of that nature, one of the first questions uh, with any good uh, process, planning process, is, well, how many do we have? So. Nobody could really tell how many traffic signals we had on the local agency level. There's not a, a single coordinated database for it. And so the, the Asset Management Council asked us to go find that out. Go talk to people, find out how many traffic signals there are. Seems easy enough, right? Boy, were we surprised. When you call people, you call a city, City of Ironwood, for example, and you say, hey, how many traffic signals do you guys have that you guys own? And they say, three. They are, they're all right down US 2. <laughs> well, okay, you don't own those, those are DOT. Oh, but they're in the city. Do you guys maintain them and pay for them? Oh no, MDOT does. Okay, well, those aren't your signals. And then they'd say, well, okay, but we have this flashing light by a four-way stop. No, that's not a traffic signal. Um, we thought, okay, it's gonna get easier when we start going to bigger agencies. And we talked to some bigger cities and found out that some bigger cities have, um, and bigger counties have um, coordination agreements between neighboring cities. So it was really hard to figure out who owned the signals and how many there were, something that seemed like it would be pretty easy. So we got innovative. We thought, how, how can we figure this out? And one of the things we looked at was traffic crash data as a source of information, as kind of like a ping and return, almost like a, like a sonar, if you think about it. It's a signal that we can process. So traffic crash records in Michigan have a traffic control field and that traffic control field, if, if the crash happened close enough to the intersection and the traffic control was a contributing factor to the crash, um, then the UD tenant form instructs officers to fill out what the traffic control is. So not every crash form has traffic control field filled out. But we realized that when we started looking around traffic signals, of course, most uh, a lot of crashes occur around traffic signals. There's a high number of them. And there's a high likelihood that um, the traffic control was involved in the crash. So they show up in the UD10 form. So what we used is kind of a consensus approach where we used the traffic crash reports and we uh, uh, figured out how far away from an intersection to look, how many years of data to look at, and then what percentage, what consensus percentage would give us the best um, measure of whether a signal was actually present at the intersection or not. So for CAMPSI's study, we were really only interested in the total number of signals. Really, that's that's all they wanted to know, just how many are there, and then roughly what the is the cost. Um, so to try to test this method, we had to go through and get ground truth. We had to find a couple of counties, go through all of the cities and counties within that geographic county, 
and identify all the traffic signals. So that usually started with uh, a call to the local agencies in that area. And then we would try to find all of those signals on Google Earth. So we had an intern go through <laughs> hours and hours and hours of looking at Google Earth to try to find traffic signals. Uh, she did a wonderful job, by the way. But uh, with the set that we had, we ended up getting a null set as well. We picked counties like Otsego County, Houghton County, Gratiot County that don't have any signals. So we applied the method there too to make sure that we weren't inventing signals in areas where there weren't signals. Um, but with that, we came up with about 2.5% uh, margin of error with our sampling. So we're pretty sure that that our results are, are pretty good in terms of reflecting the accuracy of what's out in the field. So what we ended up doing is we were able to find about 99% of the count of all of the traffic signals in the ground truth areas that we went. So that means that um, our actual count was, with, was within 1% of the true number. And then one of the surprises was that our location precision, that means that every time we said there was a signal there, was there actually a signal there if we looked at it? Um, that was as high as 89.5%. And so that includes places like um, uh, non-intersection signals. So uh, preemption signals, um, signals that are at locations like mid-block crosswalks or, or uh, railroad crossings. We, we included that as a, um, the method wouldn't find those. Uh, so those that's where some of the location uh, precision falls in. But this is a map of where all the local agency traffic signals were detected by the method. And there are some false positives in there, but like I said, for the most part, the accuracy is pretty, pretty good in terms of the total amounts. Um, kind of fun facts with traffic signals. There's only 2% of all of the state's local traffic signals are north of the line from Huron County to Mason County, so north of Clare, right? Uh, there's only about 136 local agency signals. And Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, you know, big surprise, have about 58% of the signals. And if we add uh, Genesee, Kent, and Washtenaw into that group, we've got about 76% of all the local agency signals. So they're, they're a regional phenomenon. They're in a, a band from Grand Rapids to Detroit, generally. When we looked at signals, uh, we also did a cost assessment to try to figure out how many dollars worth of asset do we have. So we've got about $2 billion uh, between local agencies and MDOT's traffic signals. There's about $2 billion in signals. So surprisingly, not a huge dollar value uh, as, as things go when we start talking about total asset value. Now, interesting part about this study, this was just kind of a one-off. Tampsy just needed to know how many were there and um, uh, how much do they cost? We got a uh, call from um, MDOT's planning group and they said, hey, could you look at that study to try to come up with Meyer fundamental data elements? And instead of just looking at signals, we're interested in signals, but can you tell where two-way stops are and four-way stops and yield signs? And we're like, ooh, boy, I don't know. So we started looking at if crash data, we're actually in the process of doing this study right now, we started looking at if crash data could be used to detect those types of traffic control. And uh, really early on, we started looking at coverage and we found out that um, it's pretty difficult to find yield signs because there's just not a lot of crashes. And there's not a lot of crashes where the traffic control was a major driver in it. So as we're reporting this back to, to the folks at MDOT, one of uh, the people in the meeting said, it's too bad you can't just use like machine vision to look at all of the crash report um, diagrams because officers typically draw in or put in uh, whether there's a signal there or, or stop signs, they draw these really intricate diagrams and there's a lot in the narrative. And so uh, we went back to the drawing board and said, well, we'll try. And so we used a machine vision application um, and we're able to train it pretty quickly to get pretty early results. And so we trained it to look for icons like traffic signals, like stop signs, and the language that is typically in uh, the narratives that can tell if it's you know stoplight, stop signal, um, signal, traffic signal. And so we try to find all those things in crash reports. And much to our, I, I shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised, but it was actually pretty easy to train a machine vision model to be able to identify um, those things. So here's here's the results from one of the crash reports from I believe it's uh, Houghton County. And it shows a two-way. We, we detected two um, stop signs and three 
vehicles. So we know this is a two-way stop control intersection. So this is something that we're doing right now. We're, we're um, refining the data model and we're gonna go through a proof of concept to see if we can expand that to try to identify two-way, four-way and, and stop with a little bit more precision. So kind of interesting stuff. So why is it innovative? It, it provides a cost-effective way to gather network level data and, and actually even local data. Um, it, it's data that we already have. It's using one data source, um, it, which kind of shows that overlap between safety and asset management, because both of those things run on data. So it's kind of interesting. Again, this is very much in the still in process phase, but we're kind of excited about trying a different tool, a different tool set on solving one of these transportation problems that you know, is kind of a difficult problem. So again, I, I think as transportation professionals, it's, it's our um, responsibility to uh, encourage that next generation of people that are gonna replace us and, and show that um, no matter what you wanna do, whether it's run a business, uh, run a piece of equipment, or, or use things like drones and AI and uh, machine vision, there's a place for you in transportation. Um, the problems that we have are just so large and, and there's such a huge benefit that comes from it. Um, it definitely warrants uh, all of these different types of tools to apply uh, to try to solve them. So um, that's all I've got for this presentation. Any questions? I know that was a lot of material really quickly. Not a question, but first of all, just thank you, Tim. That, that was a really good presentation. And I appreciate how you highlighted how uh, you saw them as being innovative. And I think just also the evolution of how the tool has been uh, used and expanded uh, is an innovation in and of itself, right? I mean, just seeing the opportunity to um, display data, to do the forecasting is just, it, you know, that in and of itself to me is is kind of an innovative approach. We found a great application here and oh by the way if we had this data now we could do it even more in some yeah. other asset class. So but really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Yeah it's it's interesting how a lot of actually all of this is user driven. So we always equate it back to uh, the idea of if we asked people in, in the 1940s, you know, what would you want in a word processor? you know, before word processors were invented when people are still using typewriters. I think most typists of the time would say, well, it'd be great if we had, you know, you didn't have to put correction fluid in there and it'd be great if I could type in red and black. You know, they wouldn't have asked for things like Microsoft Word. <laughs> it just was too far away from um, what the user could understand as a need. But as these tools evolve, I think that's that's the focus in, in having a, a tight tie with the user base as these tools tools evolve, they also drive new ideas for new innovation, new need, um, and new ways to to try to get the same pieces of information uh, quicker, faster, stronger. So, again, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, you've done a great job on you know LTAPs. Just just Roadsoft. I look back at the history of Roadsoft and. Um, you know, that as an incrementally stepped forward, I haven't been in it recently, but just showing what you guys have accomplished is, is great. Um, and that machine visioning, um, I love that idea. And just that you think about the photographs that are out there and the amount of, um, I know something that Matt Chinawa's group, the bridge folks had talked about, they've got all those photos from bridge inspection. Well, can we use that to collect the data um, and, and fill our, our um, information, right? rather than that manual collection and stuff. You get rid of yeah, the human error and such. So it's, that's, it's really cool. Yeah, it is, it is pretty scary how far machine vision has come. I mean, the models that are out there that are consumer grade models are, I mean, it's pretty easy to, to train them. There's data sets out there that can identify the age of people from photos, uh, whether they're happy, angry, sad, <laughs> um, little, little scary, but though, <laughs> It's neat to see those uh, those things being used for the forces of good in transportation. <laughs> Most definitely. So any other, yeah, you know, Fawcaster, you know, Roadsoft, that, you know, the, that traffic control, that's great. Those are definitely innovative. You can see that in each of them. So any other questions out there? Oh, 
Well, thanks again for your time. Appreciate it. It's always fun talking to this group. So <laughs> great. Um, that's the last um, agenda item we have. Is there any other kind of open discussion type? We do have a few minutes here. We're we're good till eleven thirty, but I can give that time back to you too. And um, oh, this is Denise. Go ahead, Denise. Yeah. Good. I I only know the old fashioned way to put my hand up. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That works too. Well, that was especially good for me, Tim, because I just hadn't been around to get the background in the history of road soft. So I was making a lot of notes over here because. That's how I remember stuff. So uh, it was good to hear that. I just uh, thought we would probably end up going around the table. So just wrote down a few things that uh, we are up to over here at CRA. Um, so particularly the two grants that this group would be interested in, and Tim didn't mention it, but they're running lead on the local road uh, research agency, uh, Pure Exchange. Uh, we are Moving ahead with that, we're closing in on a date in October. It's taken a while for hotels to be willing to return calls. Uh, Tim pulled together the kickoff meeting off. It was last week or the week before that. And so we've got a new finance person here. So since we're doing you know, some of the in kind and whatnot and um, trying to select the hotel so that we can get a nice hybrid going with our members and give them the opportunity. Um, so we're looking at at Kent County and Grand Rapids. That's got the International Airport pretty accessible. So uh, we're just today, Tim, going to be looking at uh, the rates and what their their per diem government rates are and blah, blah, blah. So anyways, I appreciate you pulling that meeting together. And uh, we're having to look now at October um, and the rates get better even at the end of October, I think when our prize is over there. So that's good. Uh, the Crisis Fiscal Recovery Playbook, again, we are appreciative of that grant uh, coming out uh, in this uh, fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> we received a good quote. Uh, I know Steve and I were looking at it over the weekend from ITC. Again, it's about the fiscal recovery part of uh, a catastrophe on the road system. So our finance director is coming up uh, to speak pretty quickly on the reporting mechanisms, working with Bruce over at MDOT to uh, sort that out. <clears throat> so we're moving down the road there. Uh, a legislative aside for this group, hold on. I turned my heater on, it was just too much. Uh, so legislatively, in this era of COVID and there's a lot more state money than that people thought. Well, we're up a billion dollars in one month legislatively on this topic. You know, we had kind of a holistic point of view here that, um, for example, I mean, Houghton, Hancock and Houghton County Road Commission are all still standing there uh, waiting for some money from the Father's Day flood of two years ago, three years ago, two years ago. Uh, and uh, some of it has come through, but we uh, would like to create uh, a pot of funds sitting out there. We've talked to MDOT and, and uh, so forth. Um, they had locals need to have this pot of money, whether it is a sinkhole in Roseville, uh, catastrophe in Gogebic, Sugar Island, you know, uh, UP seems to have its share of those. Um, that funds would be sitting there and that you wouldn't have to run a bill every time that there was a disaster on the road system. And therefore, it kind of depends on the popularity and the political party of your elected official, whether you can get funds back from that. So uh, that has really caught fire in the legislature, just the whole concept of <clears throat> maybe being a little more prepared um, with matching funds and so forth. So. I think this whole area of crisis recovery is, um, you know, we're really excited and it, it seems to be making a lot of sense to a lot of people. So we appreciate um, your support there. CRA, of course, we are back to work in person. I know Steve has a background that makes it look like, I don't know where he's at, but he is here, uh, he is here across the hall from me. Uh, we've been here every day since May of 2020. So. Uh, we've held three conferences in the month of May, uh, as many as 90 people and a couple that were about 50. And so those went well. Um, and I'm hoping that in our third quarter here, we're going to reserve our resume our in-person council meetings. We did have a golf outing. Wayne was instrumental in our golf outing and has recovered from that last week. So uh, we did a couple last year too. So we're getting back to business here. 
Um, also, CRA has released about three weeks ago our county road investment plan. Uh, this is the second one we did. A um, lot of data there, in fact, came out of RoadSoft. Ultimately, I know Larry Brown has worked with Tim and we've improved some, he's improved some training, I think, about the road treatments. And so uh, we put that out as the legislature, uh, my understanding, very committed to coming up with a long-term solution, you know, beyond the current year's budget. Uh, local bridge bundling, I think I saw that Matt was on this call somewhere. We put out a news release kind of saying this is a historic opportunity for Michigan to really seize on um, extra funds. You know, one-time funds are a great use for bridges to play catch up with the $900 million local problem. And so um, it appears at this point they are trying to outdo one another with the governor starting with the $300 million, the House saying, We'll see that and we'll add you 226 million. And then the Senate coming out about 10 days ago saying, we're going to up you all to $1.2 billion. So, uh, I, you know, I, we're not going to get all of that, but it is a nice uh, little arms race or something, bridge race to the top. So we'll see. Um, and of course, Tim, you know, we're working on the ad successor to field manager. And, and so we were just talking about that this morning, Tim, we we're going to be revising that RFP and getting it back. So we have a, a group called the Local Agency Project Administration, um, something else, there's another word to it, work group, I guess. And uh, so MDOT has, you know, agreed we're going to use some off the top the next two years. And finally, we've got this project uh, moving again. I think the biggest burr under our saddle here is uh, we're trying to figure out uh, as this uh, SHPO programmatic agreement. So the State Historic Preservation Office, as that programmatic agreement uh, is working uh, its way towards uh, completion in July of 2022, uh, you know, we started out in January looking for nine clarifications on the existing exemptions. Uh, we have put a literally hundreds of hours of staff time, road agency time, a lot of money into photographs. That's not the easiest topic to illustrate for a Zoom meeting. Um, and uh, now we're kind of in the process, I guess, of converting, MDOT is converting that into a screening tool instead of a list of nine exemptions. Uh, this took us by surprise a couple of weeks ago uh, when that was unveiled to our meeting last Wednesday. Uh, we took about 10 steps straight backwards in, in meaning that two thirds of projects that were are currently exempt would suddenly fall in a category that would require a review by the historian and the archaeologist. So uh, we're pretty distressed about that right now. It's going to take, uh, and, and so that is kind of taking center stage for us here as a top priority. We'll be working uh, with Margaret Berendis. I'll probably talk with her today or tomorrow. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see where we go from there, Ted. We may be uh, contacting you in the future, but um, that's um, not the direction we were planning to go after Steve researching so many other states. But, uh, Steve, what else have I missed that we should say we're up to? Anything? Um, I think you covered it well, but I did want to just clarify. I had to put a virtual window in to keep my virtual plant alive here. So that's what's going on in my office here. <laughs> it's like a Harry Potter room. When you go in there, it does not look anything like that. <laughs> that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Denise, for the update. Anybody else? All right, hearing none. Um, well, uh, I've got uh, we've got our business meeting next month, and then the following meeting um, will be uh, the aggregate association. So, Doug, you'll take the lead on that. Again, a reminder of. Um, Dan already let me know to, uh, you know, they'll sponsor. So if there's anybody else for the stick award, um, excellence award, let me know that. Um, but everybody have a great rest of your day then. And happy Father's Day to those belated <laughs> to those fathers out there. So we'll talk to you. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carol.